Hello, welcome to Zigma Tech Learning Hub. I will be your instructor for chemistry. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. If you don't have the application already installed on your device or on your phone, I will want you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams like UTME, Post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, KCPE, IJMB, JUPEP, Calvedpedia, BECE, JSCE, NCEE, NECO, etc. You can download the app from www.examguide.com or Google Play Store. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to be updated on new videos. Ready for today's class? Okay, let's get started. Okay, for this lesson, we are going to be talking about the phenomena supporting the kinetic theory of matter, part two. Remember, the part one, we talked about diffusion, and I told you the four phenomena that supported the kinetic theory of matter, which are diffusion, dialysis, Brownian motion, and the osmosis. These are the four phenomena that supported the kinetic theory of matter. Okay, how do they how did they support it? I'm going to try, try to do a recap. The diffusion supported it based on the movement of gases, gas particles, gas molecules. Okay, how they expose themselves in air randomly. Why the dialysis supports the kinetic theory of matter based on the molecules or particles in solids. In solids, okay, and based on the movement of particles in solids. Then the osmosis supports this kinetic theory based on the movement of particles in liquids. How they move in liquids. Why the Brownian motion is the movement itself. Okay, their movement. The movement of the particles in solid, movement of the particles in liquid, movement of the particles in gas. Okay, their movement is called Brownian, uh, that particular movement they make, okay? The Brownian motion supports the movement these particles make. I'm just trying to bring, you, bring, bring your mind back in what we discussed in the phenomena supporting the kinetic theory of matter in part one. Now, at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to know what is effusion. The Graham's law of diffusion and effusion, the differences and similarities between diffusion and effusion about Brownian motion. You know about Brownian motion and you know what dialysis is. What dialysis is. Now, the first one is effusion and molecular effusion. Remember, diffusion, okay, is the movement of particles from a high to low concentration. In essence, if they move, all right, from one low concentration from one high concentration to a low concentration. In essence, for them to move, they must pass through a medium. Every movement has a medium. So they must pass through a medium. Now, if those gases are being collected from one place to another, it is called to effuse. Remember, they will first of all diffuse, fill the container. Then they will come out. When they come out, it becomes uh, effusion. When they come out from the container, it becomes effusion. They will first of all be inside the container. Remember, gases are liquids when confined in a container. Gases turn liquids when confined in a container because of condensation. You know, when the gas enters, they touch the walls of the container. And in that sense, they become a liquid. And their molecules hit themselves randomly. So when they try to see an escape route and they come out from the hole, it becomes a, a fusion. Now let's know what effusion is. Effusion or, mo or molecular effusion. Anyone you like, you call it molecular effusion simply is because of the molecules are coming out. In essence, the molecules are effusing, the molecules are escaping out of the container. So effusion is the movement of gas molecules from one container to another via tiny pinhole. The movement of gases from one container to another via tiny pinhole. Like I said, if these gases escape from one container to another, Definitely, the hole is going to be tiny. Take for example, take for example, fractional distillation. 
distillation rather. Let's take distillation. Distillation you take from one container to another. Separation. Okay? As the gases are moving, as the vapor is moving to another container, it is changing. Okay? Now, we, we, we take this uh, palm wine, palm wine and ethanol. From palm wine, you get ethanol. Now, as you're boiling the palm wine, there is a vapor that will come out. That vapor is gas. As the vapor is entering into another container via tiny pinhole, in that sense, the, the palm wine has been diffused and it has changed to gas. As it's entering, because of the heat, as it's entering into another container, it turns to ethanol. Now, that movement of gas molecules from this particular distillation column to a container where I want to take it is called effusion. It's called effusion. Because when they transfer their movement from one place to another, from one container to another, it becomes effusion. Now, this effusion, you remember they cover a distance. For fusion to occur, the molecules must have to cover a distance. Because every movement covers length. And length is distance uh, covered. For you to move from point A to point B, you have covered the distance. You have covered the length. Now, that particular length that they cover, that distance they cover, is called the mean free path. The mean free path. Let's know what the mean free path is. The mean free path is a term used to describe the average distance traveled by a molecule between collusion between collision. As they are moving, remember, they are colliding with, with each other. As they are moving, they are colliding because they move randomly. As they are moving, they are colliding. As they are moving, they are colliding. So they will collide until they enter into the next container. When they enter into the next container, they will still start their colliding because of the brand name. Remember, we said the kinetic theory is the, is, is, is the movement of particles on a steady. Okay, because they have kinetic energy, these particles move randomly. They move constantly without stopping. So as they are moving, they move constantly without stopping. Without stopping. Now that term, that particular distance traveled, that particular distance they cover is called the mean free path. It's called the mean free path. The distance that molecules travel, the distance that molecules travel is called the mean free path. The distance that molecule travel because of a fusion is called the mean free path. Now, there is a law that binds the effusion and diffusion. Remember, diffusion will first of all occur first before a fusion will take place. So when the gas has been diffused, when the gas has expanded, when the gas is ready to move, okay, they will come out. And that particular coming out is called effusion. Now, the Graham's law, the Graham's law was talked about by Thomas Graham. Okay? Talked about by, by Thomas Graham in 1836. Using gas molecules. Using gas molecules. He saw that when he put a gas inside a container, it became a, a liquid. In essence, the gas became diffused. Now, when he made a tiny hole to check if, because when he shaked it, he saw that there was a liquid inside. So he wanted to make a hole to peep, to look inside if truly it was a liquid. Now, when he mistakenly brought the hole, the gas escaped vigorously. The gas escaped uh, vigorously. So in essence, he came to realize that every single molecule, every single gas that is being contained in a container is actually looking for a way to escape. It's like they locked you up in a prison. Okay? You'll be looking for a way to escape. If they mistakenly open that cell or that prison for you, the way you run out with happiness, that's the same thing that the gas is doing. So as the gas is diffusing, the gas is expanding inside the container, looking for a place to escape. So he came to realize that this particular thing happened. So in essence, he knew that when a gas diffuses, in the diffusion, the gas expands to fill this container. In the diffusion, inside the container, inside the container. It is only when the gas comes out that they can change from a high concentration to a low concentration. In essence, for diffusion to be possible, a fusion must take place. 
For the future to be possible, a future must take place. An escape must take place. Now, let's know the great answer of diffusion. The great answer of diffusion states that the rate of diffusion or effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its density. In that sense, the square root of its vapor density. You can see, say, its vapor density. You can see, say, its density. Now, I said the rate of diffusion or effusion of a gas is not equal to the square root of its density. Density means per mass by unit volume. We know that. The mass, okay, occupying a volume. That's density. So it's trying to tell us that the rate at which this gas escapes, the rate at which they fill a container is, is not equal to the square root of their mass or density. Because if you allow a gas to escape, a gas does not have a fixed mass, it does not have a fixed volume. So it cannot be equal to diffusion and effusion. That density there talks about mass and uh, volume. And gases do not have fixed volume, they don't have fixed uh, mass. In a sense, they cannot be equal to the way they escape or the way they are being trapped. Because when they are trapped, they, they're supposed to have a fixed volume, but they don't. Because sometimes they expand and they compress. So, as they are compressing, their volume, as they are expanding, their volume is increasing. As they are compressing, their volume is reducing. So, in essence, they do not have a fixed mass. That process where they are compressed, their mass is less. That process where they are expanded, their mass is high. So, in essence, as they are diffusing or effusing, they cannot be equal to the mass and their volume, which is the density. So, this mathematically, the Graham's law of diffusion mathematically. is R1 all over R2, which is equal to M2 all over square root M1. We have R1 is the rate of effusion of the gas, as in the rate of escape, the rate of effusion of first gas. R2 is the rate of effusion of second uh, gas. M1 <coughs> molar mass of molar mass of first gas and M2 molar mass of second uh, gas. When we get to the, the gas laws part 3, who know how to use these particular formulas in solving. Okay? This is just a theoretical explanation of the grams of diffusion. When we get to the part three, the gas laws part three, we will know the quantitative solving of the grams of diffusion. Now, this is a mathematical expression. Okay? R1 all over R2 equal M2 all over M1. And I told you that the rate of effusion of the first gas, the speed it's used in escaping, the first gas, the speed and rate it's used in escaping for the second gas, then the molar mass of the first gas, the molar mass of the first gas, let's say hydrogen. What is the molar mass of hydrogen? What is the molar mass of nitrogen? I talked about molar masses when we talked about the, the chemical uh, uh, combination formula and equation. Okay, so this is the mathematical explanation this is a mathematical formula of the Graham's law of diffusion. Now, looking at this, I can deduce it or summarize it in a simple term. Now, when you divide the rate 1 and rate 2, it will give you the rate. When you divide the rate 1 and rate 2, it will give you what? The rate. Then, when you divide the, uh, M2 and M1, it gives you the density. When you divide the M2 and M1, it gives you what? The density. In essence, Graham's law of diffusion, the Graham law of diffusion the law of diffusion can still be written as it can still be written as R equal 1 over square root uh, P. Where R is the rate 
of effusion of the first and second gas. Of fusion of the first and second gas. And P, we know, is the symbol of uh, density. So like I said, when you calculate the R1 and R2, it gives you the rate. Then when you calculate the M1 and M2, it gives you the what? Density. It's a very simple thing. Then when you get the two, the uh, rate and the density, you now say the rate is equal to 1 over the square root of the density. Then you get your answer. When we get to the gas loss 2, we are going to talk about that. We are going to, sorry, when we get to gas loss 3, we are going to use formulas in solving this Graham's law of uh, diffusion. This is just a theoretical part of it. Now, differences between effusion and diffusion. First of all, diffusion occurs when gas molecules dispense in a container, spread. Okay? While effusion occurs when the gas molecules escape via tiny pinhole. When they dispense, when they spread, when they expand, when they compress. Okay? That's only when they can struggle to come outside. And merely they come outside from the pinhole, it becomes a, a fusion. So when they come outside, when they escape, it becomes a fusion. When they dispense, it becomes diffusion. So say, oh, the particles move faster in a fusion, but in diffusion, it depends on the size of the particles. Okay? Now, in a fusion, as they are escaping, when you open, it's like when a gas is compressed. Now, you mistakenly open a hole. They will come out speedily. Scatteredly, okay. While in a fusion, it depends on the size of the molecules, it depends on the size of the particles. That's how they move. Remember, I told you diffusion, the particles do not move and at the same rate. When I talked about diffusion, they don't move at the same rate. The bigger ones and the smaller, the smaller ones will move faster than the bigger ones. Now, particles struggle to pass through a mean free path. Whereas in diffusion, particles have a great deal of space to move around. They are they, they have a space, okay, they can do anything they like, but it's like they tell 10 people to pass one small door, they will struggle to pass, that's the fusion. They will be struggling to pass, because the particles are many, they will be struggling to pass that small hole. But in diffusion, the space are large for them to diffuse, so they play around in the container before they come out. Now, the similarities between both of them, they both affect the movement of particles. They both affect the movement of um, particles. Diffusion is the movement of particles from high to low concentration. Uh, effusion is the movement of particles through a pinhole. So both of them affect the movement of uh, particles. Now, the next one is the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion. Brownian motion, we know, was talked about by Brown. Okay, using a polygrain. He dropped a polygrain on water and he saw that their movement was unstoppable. Their movement was unstoppable. Okay, that is when he knew that they moved haphazardly. Okay, so because of this experimental evidence, the haphazard movement of every particle was given to idolize the name Brown. So they called it Brownian uh, motion, Brownian movement. Any I want to call it the Brownian motion or the Brownian movement. Okay? The polygrain on water went scattered. There was no way to handle this, uh, poly this, this, this movement of particles. Now, let's know what the Brownian motion is. As you can see, they are moving. They are moving. Okay? They do not have uh, any, no, no stopping. They have enough kinetic energy in their movement. And this is what the, the, the Brandner motion used in supporting the kinetic theory of uh, matter. Now, the Brandner motion of movement, also called pedesis, is defined as the uncontrolled erratic or haphazard movement of particles in fluid due to, your, due to their constant collision. Due to their constant collision. As they are moving, remember, if you're moving randomly, if, if I, I put you in a room and I said all of you should be running, maybe people are like 100, and I'll put you in one room and say you should be running. As you're running, you'll be hitting yourselves. 
Okay, you'll be hitting yourself due to constant collision. And we said the moving particles in fluid. I told you fluids are either solid, either liquid, gas, or plasma. These are the three subsets of fluid. Okay, these are the ways that the fluid can exist. Either liquid, so, uh, plasma, or gas. So these particular particles in them move haphazardly, move uncontrollably. They are not controlled, as you can see on the screen. They are scattered and they are colliding. They always collide in that movement. So using this particular movement, they came to realize that the kinetic theory, kinetic, which is the movement theory of matter, they came to realize that the Brownian motion was a quantitative explanation of the kinetic theory of matter. Remember, the, the movement is uncontrolled. Now, there is a law that binds this particular thing. Okay, there's a law that binds that thing. They say the law states that because of the particles are not still, they frequently collide with each other. Because the particles are not still, they frequently collide with each other. Now, when they collide, okay, when they collide, there is um, a tendency that if I hit you, you go to another place. Okay, now. But there is something that causes this Brownian motion. Something causes this Brownian motion. It is, it is caused by the structure and physics of fluid. The particles travel on a straight line until they will be redirected by collision. So as they are moving, like I said, if I hit you, you go to another side. As I'm coming, if I hit you, you shift to another side. Like I said, if all of you are men in the room, and I said you should run, you will run on the straight line. As you're running, another person will hit you. As the person hits you, you will shift to another place. And that's why your movement will be directed because of that uh, collision. Now, it is caused by the structure of molecules and the physics of fluid. Physics of fluid simply talks about the miracle of fluid. Okay? The physics of fluid. The natural way. Okay? Remember, physics was formerly called natural science. So the natural way, the natural way this fluid uh, 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 behave, how do they behave? Brownian motion is being caused by it. Okay, the bigger size will move faster than the small. The smaller size will move faster than the bigger size because of its size and the structure. Now, the law, like I said, of Brownian motion, it states because particles cannot completely stay still, they frequently collide with each other. They frequently collide with each other. Now. These particles can be atoms or molecules. Okay? Particles can be atoms. Now, when these atoms, when an atom comes together to form one single atom, it's called a superatom. When an atom or molecule come together to form one particular atom, it's called a superatom. Now, Lord Relay came to make an experiment on Brownian motion. And he came to see that there is a stopping in Brownian motion. Now, he said, a drop of certain substances, known as oil or fatty acid, forms a circular film when dropped on the water surface. And that the film is one molecule thick when they spread and stop. A drop of certain substances, known as oil or fatty acid, forms a circular film when dropped on the water surface. And that the film is one molecule thick when they spread and stop. This law is called the Lord Relay's law. Now, if you drop, uh, if, if, you, if you put a drop of oil in water, okay, you see that the drop of oil will scatter. Next, the particles will scatter, the molecules will scatter, the atoms will scatter. But at a particular point in time, they will now come together again to form one particular shape. And that shape, is called superatom. That shape is called is one molecule thick. In essence, the Brownian motion has stopped in that particular context. But naturally, the Brownian motion, the particles do not stay still. They, they don't stay still, so they frequently collide with each other. Because they are not still, because they move on a steady, their kinetic energy is strong, so they will collide with each other. That is how they supported the kinetic theory of matter. Now, the conclusion on the Brownian motion. The direction of the force of atomic bombardment is constantly changing. And at different times, the particles is hit more on one side than another. 
leading to the seemingly random nature of motion. So this particular bombardment between atom and atom is constantly changing. Because if I hit you, as I'm hitting you, another person is hitting me at the back. Another person is hitting me at the back. So that's how they hit themselves. So, so they do not stop. They do not uh, stop. At different times, but they hit one side or another. So they do not stop. So as they're hitting themselves, they cannot stop. So the random nature of motion is definitely going to take place. Because as I hit you, another person hitting me, another person hitting me. So we are, we are moving on a steady. In this particular point, kinetic theory has been established. Now, the next one is dialysis. Dialysis, like I said, talks about the, 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 the movement of particles in a solid. Okay, that's how they use supporting kinetic theory of matter. Okay, how solids move, how the particles in solid move. Remember, the three uh, uh, a classical states of matter, the diffusion gas particles, the osmosis water particles, the dialysis solid particles, and the Brownian motion, how they move. Now, this dialysis was still talking about by Thomas Graham, using a parchment and salt. Using a parchment and a salt. When you put salt into a parchment, let's say this parchment is a bag that they use their patch in doing. He put salt in a parchment and put water inside. Okay? Now, when he put water inside, he raised the salt and the water. He saw that all the water left the salt. But not all the salt left the water. All the water left the salt. But not all the salt left the water. Why? Because we got the taste in the salt. In essence, the salt, those tastes, that taste that we got in that salt, remember salt is a solid. So that taste we got in that salt became crystalline, became solid. It came to realize that there are particles in that water that are salty. Because if the particles of salt did not enter into the water, that water cannot be salty. He now came to realize that in every single mixture, solid particles are suspended. In every mixture, solid particles are what? Suspended. And those particles will definitely move because of the Brownian uh, motion. Now, what is dialysis? Dialysis is a separation of suspended colloidal particles from crystalloids by means of by means of their unequal rate of diffusion through the pores of a semi-permeable membrane. Like I told you, that particular parchment became a semi-permeable uh, membrane through the pores. That small pores became a space for them to pass. Okay? Now, the separation of the suspended collider particles of, from crystalloids by means of their unequal rate of diffusion. The particles' unequal rate of diffusion, like I told you, the unequal rate of diffusion is based on the size of their particles. So they cannot have equal rates of diffusion. Because the bigger one, like I said, the smaller one, the smaller particles will move faster than the bigger one. So because of these particles in solids, because of their movement, they pass through a semi-permeable membrane. Now when they pass through, it becomes dialysis. Now let's know what a semi-permeable membrane is. A semi-permeable membrane, also called partial membrane. Semi means I am not uh, first, I am not second. I'm in the middle. So it is partial. It's also called partial membrane. It's that which allows certain molecules or ions to pass through it by diffusion. Like I said, these particles, these colloidal particles, passed through that parchment. In essence, that parchment was literally the semi-permeable membrane, according to his own experiment. So in essence, the ions, remember, salt is made of sodium and chlorine. Common salt. So in essence, they have ions, they have charges. So when they pass, okay, when they pass, and this salt has uh, particles because they became a compound. So they have particles. In essence, they have uh, molecules. So in essence, they have molecules and they still have uh, ions. So, when they, when they pass through that parchment, that hole, it is both the molecules and the ions that passed, but it was via diffusion. Why? Because when the water was being placed with the salt, it was in a high density. It was in a high density. Remember, the mass increased. 
and the volume they occupied increased. So it was in a high density, it was in a high concentration. So as they're coming out from that particular hole, they became uh, low. They became uh, low. So as they are passing, that particular parchment they passed through became the semi-permeable uh, semi membrane based on its uh, 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 experiment. Now it became semi-permeable membrane because not all the molecules and ions passed through, like I told you. Because the salt was inside the parchment. There are some salts inside the parchment. So not all the salt passed through. Do you understand what I mean? Not all the salt passed through. So in essence, it became a partial membrane. It became a partial space. It became a partial road for them to pass. So, these particles that pass through, now let's know the particles that will pass through the semi-permeable membrane. Okay, from the, uh, via dialysis. Now, the colloidal particles, like we said, are microscopic solid particles suspended in a fluid. That's what I told you in the beginning when I talked about the dialysis. So these salt particles, these salt particles are suspended in the fluid, with, which is uh, water. That is why you see the taste of a salt solution becomes uh, salty. Because the solid particles, uh, when they are coming out from that bag, that he used in the experiment. Or let's say when they are coming out through the semi-permeable membrane, they are supposed to, they, they will carry their particles, they will carry their salt particles. The, part, the, the, the salt, the solid has particles. Okay? Now being mixed with a fluid, which is a liquid, the particles must definitely mix with the liquid. So, the microscopic solid particles suspended in a fluid, these are the are the things that passes through the semi-permeable uh, membrane because of diffusion. Because of diffusion. Like I said, the solid particles that are suspended in a fluid, in essence, these particles will make that fluid change its taste. Solid particles will make that fluid change its what? Taste. Why? Because the particles will be suspended inside the fluid. Next, the particles are inside the fluid. Remember, you're not seeing it. The only way you can know there are solid particles inside the fluid is when you test it. So these are the particles that pass through the semi-permeable membrane via diffusion. Now, the colloidal suspension, like we talked about, is a powerful model system for the study of other phenomena in condensed matter, where the collective phase behaves, where the collective phase behavior of a solid mimics that of other condensed system. It mimics it. Mimic means to behave like. To behave like. Now, the colloidal suspension, let's take for the, 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 a, a condensed matter. Water, I can say water is a condensed matter. Why? Because when gases condense, they turn to water via condensation. Now, when this, uh, they say the solid will mimic the condensed matter, the condensed system. Now, when the salt, enters into water, the salt becomes a liquid. In essence, the salt has behaved like the liquid. <laughs> I, told you, I, I, I told you of a matter when we talked about solution. Solution. In essence, both of them will give you a single product. Why? Because the solid, the solute has behaved like the liquid. In essence, since it has behaved like liquid, they now have the same behavior. In essence, they become one. They now become a one. So that is why when you put the salt into water and you turn it and drink it, it becomes salty. But you don't see the salt. The only thing you see is water. Why? Because the solid, like I said, has behaved, has mimicked, okay, has behaved like the liquid, the condenser system. So this collider suspension, okay, the solid has been suspended. The solid has been suspended from its original property. He now behaves like the property that he's been put into, which is the condensed system, which is the condensed matter. Condensed matter there means, the, the, the matter there means a liquid. The matter there is a liquid. Because when they say condensed, gases condense to turn to liquid. So the matter there means uh, a liquid. So it means condensed uh, gas. I think that's a condensed gas. Okay, so the matter becomes uh, a liquid. So this is the collateral suspension. 
they call it their suspension. Now, what are crystalloids, like I said? In the definition of dialysis, these are the words we pick out. Are dissolved ions or molecules of small dimension. Dissolved ions or molecules of smaller dimension. The salt into water will dissolve. The ions will dissolve. The molecules will still dissolve. Okay? If they don't dissolve, if they don't dissolve, they cannot form that uh, solution. So this particular thing tells us on how dialysis operates. Now, conclusion on dialysis. Conclusion on dialysis. Separation by dialysis is a slow process, depending for its speed in the differences in particle size and diffusion rate between the collodial and the crystallodial constituents. And may be accelerated by heat or if the crystalloids are charged by applying an electric field, it becomes electrodialysis. So, separation is a slow process, like I said. As they are passing through the membrane, remember there are plenty. They will pass through a particular place. Now, I, I still go back to how, how dialysis occurred by uh, Graham when he used a parchment, a bag, a parchment. Now, if you put a parchment, if you put water and salt, of which he used, into a parchment, into a bag. Okay, these bags they use in bagging rice and uh, our local gari. If you read it up, you see that the water will be dropping small, small. It will not be dropping fast. It will be dropping small, small. So in that sense, it is a slow process. And now as they're dropping, the particles will be struggling to come out. So as they're struggling to come out, they'll be coming out uh, slowly. But the only way they can be accelerated is by heating or when you apply an electric field, charge particles. Okay, remember anything that comes in contact with heat becomes fast because heat energy is the energy of moving particles. Moving particles. So this dialysis is a slow process based on the diffusion. Diffusion is a slow process. Okay, diffusion two is, 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 is sorry, the, 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 the diffusion two is the process that leads to dialysis. Now, we know that diffusion is being accelerated by the sizes of uh, particles. That is the rate how they move. So anything that diffusion is in will definitely correct the characteristics. So this dialysis two is based on the different size of particles too. Who will first of all come out from that parchment? Who first of all come out from that semi-permeable membrane? So it comes in a slow process. Now, when they come out in a semi-permeable membrane, they support the kinetic theory of matter. Now, let's know what electrodialysis is. Electrodialysis is a process by which electrical charge membranes are used to separate ions from an aqueous solution by the driving force of an electric potential difference. Aqueous solution, like I said, the solution where the solvent is uh, water. That's why we use salt and uh, water. So, this particular electrodialysis is the process by electrical charge membranes. Use electrical charge bodies. Okay? Electrical charge bodies. We can say fire. You can say heat. You can be boiling water. So as you're boiling water, the ions have been separated from aqueous solution via evaporation. The water, the water particles will leave, and the solid particle, which is the salt, will remain evaporation. Because heat already is electrical. Heat has charges. Okay? Heat conducts charges. It is heat that even gives us light. So when we put the heat and in the aqueous solution, in the salt and water, like I said, it's going to be differentiated. They said used to separate ions. In essence, the salt has ions and the water has ions. Remember, the water is by hydrogen and the oxygen. I don't know, oxygen has positive and uh, negative. The positive hydrogen and the negative uh, oxygen. And the salt, the positive so, uh, sodium and the negative uh, chlorine. So they are going to be separated via this electrical charge membrane. Okay, we use heat as a case study for an electrical charge membrane. So when the water is being heated, the aqueous solution, like I said, the solution where the solvent is water. So when the water is being heated, Remember, a solution, something must be inside the water. Something must have dissolved inside the water. So we use salt. When the salt is being dissolved, when you heat it, okay, the electrical potential difference will show. And they are going to be separated. Potential means storage, stored energy. 
the electrical stored energy will show. So they are going to be separated via evaporation. The water will go and the salt will remain. In essence, you have separated this particular thing and that will become our electrodialysis. Thank you very much. We've gone to the end of this section. But before we leave, we use our exam guide in quantifying what we have learned as, as we usually do to know our current uh, state. Now this is 2010, number 25. 2010, let's go to 2010, objectives, and our objective, okay, Twenty-five. now they say, given that arrow is the rate and P is density, the expression arrow 1 over square root P represents, okay, it's still on the board. It's still on the board. So you just know the answer. The answer is still on the board. You say Boyle's law. Boyle's law do not talk about density. Charles' law, no. Dalton's law, no. The Graham's uh, law. I told you the arrow is the rate and the 1 over P represents this particular thing. Why? Because of the definition of the Graham's law. Well, the definition of the Graham's law that tells us that the, 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 the rate is not equal to the density. The rate at which these particular things move, the rate at which these uh, this, uh, 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 gases move via effusion or diffusion is not equal to their mass and uh, volume. So the answer is D, Graham's uh, law. Now, our second question, they say state Graham's law of diffusion. Take Graham's law of diffusion. Now, I said it for you. I said the Graham's law of diffusion states okay, that the rate of effusion or diffusion of a gas is inversely proportional to its density. The rate of diffusion or effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to its uh, density. You can say the rate of diffusion or effusion of a gas is not equal to its mass and volume. Because density is mass per unit uh, volume. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using the exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can learn a particular topic of interest with different modes like study mode, mock mode, and practice mode. It also has other features that make learning fun. It is a must-have for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell and share the videos to people that will benefit from it. Bye.